Great. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Sean Michael Kerner, and you guys are in the OpenStack security session, so you picked the right session, because there is no more important session uh, than this one, because if anybody tells you that they're not interested in security, uh, they might be misleading you, because uh, everybody is. Uh, I'm an editor at uh, eWeek and Internet News, uh, but you're not here to listen to me, you're here to uh, listen to this panel. Uh, we've got a panel of experts on OpenStack security from multiple aspects from the internal project, uh, the VMT project from Barbican, uh, and then people that just work uh, on OpenStack security at the largest public OpenStack cloud vendor. Uh, so it's a good mix, because when we think about security, security means a couple different things, right? There's the OpenStack security project, uh, there's the VMT, the vulnerability management team, there are OpenStack security projects, which are things like uh, Barbican, and we have people from Barbican, uh, the Barbican project here, the PTL. Uh, and then there's uh, how we actually implement things. So all those things mean security and everything in between. Uh, so just to introduce uh, the panel, uh, and we'll just go on the line, and everyone will introduce uh, themselves. Cool. Awesome. So uh, my name is Douglas Mendizabal. I've been working on Barbican for about four years. Uh, formerly at Rackspace, currently in between jobs. Um, and I was barbecuing PTL for a while, uh, not any longer. Uh, also, I've been working with the security team uh, sort of on, for fun on my off time. Uh, so I know a bunch of those guys. Yeah, my name's Jeremy. Um, a lot of the community, technical community, probably knows me as Fungi. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the community vulnerability management team since 2012 or somewhere like that. Um, and uh, hold a lot of other roles in the community, technical committee, PTL of the infra team, foundation staff member, et cetera. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave McCowan, and I uh, work for Cisco in our cloud solutions business unit. Uh, my focus there is securing uh, our NFBI, which is the foundation for our uh, NFB solutions. And upstream, uh, I'm the current PTL of uh, Barbican, taking over from, uh, from Doug, working on, uh, on key management. I'm, I'm surrounded. <laughs> so I'm Major Hayden. Uh, I work at Rackspace on our private cloud product, so I focus on just security among other things in general. Um, a lot around upgrading and maintaining. Uh, and lately, the biggest project for me has been the OpenStack Ansible security project, which um, applied SIG hardening standards to any host that you have, OpenStack or not. Great. Uh, and I'm hoping that this session will be uh, as interactive as it can be, because uh, security is not a spectator sport. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to uh, take up uh, one of the mics uh, if you ever have questions. I've got a few. Uh, leading questions, but uh, you've got experts up here, so if you have questions, by all means. And to those of you that are watching in the, in the future, in the recording, sorry, you'll have to email us afterwards. Uh, and just to go uh, right to left uh, and talk to you, Doug, first, and then everyone can answer in line if you want or jump in. What do you guys think is working well across OpenStack security today? And that's a, a big question because there could be the various pieces that you're working on, whether it's the Barbican project, other projects, VMT, or, or in general. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I think has been really cool uh, in the last few cycles is the adoption of Bandit. Uh, so Bandit's one of the security team's uh, tools that does static code analysis. And um, I think the community has been very receptive about adding new gates to have Bandit test their um, code bases. Just a little color on what Bandit is. B Bandit, for those of you that don't know, uh, one of the most amazing projects, in my opinion, it was static analysis that fits in Garrett so that when people contribute code, all the code is actually scanned for vulnerabilities, if I understand it correctly, which is amazing. Because uh, when you think about the vast majority of all projects in GitHub, people post it, and then people consume it, and you have no idea whatsoever it's if ever been audited for any kind of security. Uh, but as, as, as Doug was saying, uh, a lot of OpenStack projects are now running through Bandit, and that's a huge difference between OpenStack and uh, just about any other infrastructure project I'm aware of. Uh, so I, I guess um, it's hard to follow that one up. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Bandit is, is really cool. Um, probably, uh, I don't know, as far as things that, that I touch on a regular basis, uh, from the vulnerability management perspective, um, the uh, recent uh, assistance that the, the broader security team in OpenStack has has given us and the community in um, 
putting together a, a plan for uh, security analysis standards so that, um, I, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with uh, VMT policy internals, but we, we basically have a relatively restricted set of projects that we feel comfortable taking responsibility for triaging vulnerability reports on and, and providing advisories. And um, we, we need some additional level of vetting of new projects that come to us and want our assistance in an ongoing basis with these things, mainly so we can make sure that they're in a good enough shape security-wise that they're not going to eat up a lot of our time. Um, and uh, that, that security analysis uh, process that um, the security team has started to pioneer is providing a, a really good outlet for these newer projects who are looking for our help to, to be able to know the sorts of things they should look at uh, in their software and come up with uh, detailed documentation of um, the, the security relevant uh, areas within their deployment configuration and so on so that then we have something we can go back to later um, to quickly assess impact if we get a vulnerability report that might relate to one of those areas. So what I think is, uh, is awesome about um, OpenStack is the, uh, the documentation that's available. Uh, when you're deploying um, a cloud, you need to secure every layer if you're going to be successful. So securing uh, the hardware, the hypervisor operating system, um, the software running in and out of uh, VMs. Um, for, for any layer and for any project, um, there's really good documentation and tools um, and best practices available to tell you how to configure it properly to harden um, your, um, your cloud in general and each component specifically. And uh, there's a lot of warnings what happens if you don't do it correctly. So the available documentation is great. I think for me it's just been actually starting to have conversations around security. So I'll say, you know, I work on a deployment project primarily, OpenStack Ansible, and it's been really nice recently because the, um, the Keystone team, for example, has added some scripts into their repo that'll do sanity checks on how you've configured Keystone. So if you've made really terrible life choices about how you configured Keystone or you forgot to change the ownership of a configuration file or something, um, Keystone has a little script that you can run that'll dump out all that data. And so what we were actually able to do was implement that in our gate jobs. So if anybody ever screwed up you know, a configuration, um, the gate job would fail and we'd go in, find out what's going on, fix it so that it wouldn't go into production that way. That's great. Uh, and, and by all means, uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, otherwise uh, I've got a long list. Uh, but it is great that, uh, that we are talking uh, about security. The first uh, OpenStack security session I went to was at the Portland Summit, and that was just before there even was a security guide. Uh, it's hard to believe that there wasn't even a guide in the beginning, but now it's a, an integrated uh, part of the project. Uh, just, just to go uh, a little bit further aside, uh, I think there's sometimes people in my line of work, not necessarily me, uh, but uh, people that misunderstand uh, OpenStack security and, and vulnerability management, which, which I know is something that you work on, on Jeremy, but uh, we'll just go for, from, from major back, I guess. Uh, what do you think is most often misunderstood when you see media reports? Again, not me, because I'm, I'm usually pretty good. But everyone else, uh, just general misconceptions about cloud security, vulnerability management, uh, and perhaps even certificate management in the case of Barbican. Yeah, so I think... Um there was always kind of that knee-jerk reaction uh, when you do cloud, whether it's in your data center or somebody else's data center, that, you know, oh, I'm losing a little bit of control, or, you know, um, you know, maybe VMs are close together, or there's things happening in my system that I can't reach out and touch. You know, for example, if you use other virtualization platforms where you have to individually do each step, it's a little bit different than using OpenStack, where you have some services that will go and take care of things for you for storage or networking and that kind of thing. So I think it's, um, it's getting past that, and then also understanding how to deploy, um, you know, how to deploy things securely. So that there's certainly a way where you can go and say, oh, I'm gonna go deploy 200 VMs and just put them all on the same network and use the same SSH key for all of them. Well, that's, you're, you're gonna have a bad time. But if you use you know, projects appropriately, networks appropriately, and, and segregate the different things that you deploy, um, I think you'll have a good experience. Um, so I think a popular misconception is that security can somehow just be configured in, uh, that you can set it and then forget it and feel comfortable you have a, a secure cloud environment. Uh, I think any ongoing security is going to take uh, ongoing monitoring, ongoing care and feeding, uh, most importantly keeping up to date on all the software packages. Um, for me, I think it seems like probably the 
the biggest issue is um, I'm, I'm going to say it's it, it's related to a, a lack of, of real education and, and engagement that we have as a, as a technical community, broader technical community, even outside of OpenStack, um, with the general public that um, there, there's this perception that security is a binary state. Either things are secure or they're vulnerable, and and really security is a is a broad gradient, and things are, are always at some point on that gradient. Um, and, and frequently people perceive them to be in a different place on the gradient than they are, but you know, the, the idea that when there's a vulnerability announced, um, details are frequently alighted or uh, just completely wrong, um, and the, the readers, uh, consumers of, of these reports don't really understand the, the risk, um, the impact of the vulnerabilities are being announced. Um, and that leads them to uh, panic, fear, um, you know, the, the sorts of things that you can imagine when, uh, when faced with the unknown. Um. Cool. Okay. And I, I would say probably, I, I don't know if I've heard it a lot recently, but certainly a few years ago, uh, a lot of people looking into the cloud to go deploy out applications uh, sort of had this impression of you can't secure things in the cloud because you don't own... Uh, the infrastructure, um, which I think that's changed. I think we have a lot of good tools now that I'll, I'll enable you to secure uh, your workloads on the cloud. Stuff like the OpenStack Ansible security uh, is a great set of Ansible things to, to help you harden your um, systems on the cloud. So, Great. And then talking about uh, Ansible, because when I think Ansible, I think, you know, playbooks and security configurations and the like. Uh, just, just to play devil's advocate, uh, OpenStack then by default, if I understand you, Dave, is not secure. So if I download uh, upstream plain vanilla OpenStack, uh, deploy it on my bare metal just because, uh, as at day zero, minute one, am I vulnerable uh, at that point? Or do I need to make some changes, whether it's installing uh, certain Barbican requirements? doing uh, some Ansible configuration, making sure I followed the VMT advisories or whatever to make sure that I'm secure at minute one. Uh, we can just go from you, Dave, if you want, or whichever way. Whoever wants to jump in, by all means. Yeah, um, I'll start. So you want to start, before you install it, you want to make sure you design it. Um, so OpenStack has, uh, has internal interfaces where we talk to the database, we talk to the message broker. Um, uh, we talk, the services talk to each other. Um, that network, you want to be isolated. You don't want to have uh, any external users have access to that network. Whereas the, the REST APIs where you talk to OpenStack, um, they are going to be open uh, by, ne by necessarily to untrusted sources. So those you want to make sure you uh, secure with, uh, with TLS, so accessing those only with HTTPS and install them with valid certificates. So uh, it starts with a, with a good design and treating each endpoint differently. I think that's where the deployment projects help as well. So, I mean, there's like OpenStack Ansible, there's uh, Cola, there's Chef, there, I mean, you name it. There's, there's a, uh, quite a few different ways to deploy it. But one of the nice things you're going to find in there is that generally the deployers will steer you in a guide of deploying in a little bit more secure way. I'll say, for example, with OpenStack Ansible, um, we, um, we actually go and make a lot of decisions, like, for example, use TLS by default. And then, you know, Nova doesn't use the same username and password to talk to MySQL that Neutron does. Um, so that way, if one part of your environment becomes compromised, it doesn't mean that they can take over the entire environment. Um, so sometimes it is nice. I mean, my employer, uh, we, we certainly do have a very uh, opinionated set of defaults when it comes to security. So sometimes if you're not entirely sure which way you should go, look to one of those deployment projects and look at what their defaults are, and it's usually a good starting point. Um, and this is an answer that a lot of people generally hate, but um, uh, it's not really as cynical as it sounds. Um, all systems are always vulnerable. So, so I mean, to directly answer your question, yes, when you deploy, deploy OpenStack or any software, you are vulnerable. Um, and there's actually a lot you can do about it, but you can never completely solve it. Um, like I was saying, security is not a binary state. Um, one of the probably the most significant challenge with system security is that you are always trying to balance security with convenience. And for every new security control you ratchet on, you make the system a little less flexible. So without 
an actual risk analysis and um, an understanding of, of your particular risk profile for your use case. There's no one way to secure a system. Um, and so for OpenStack or for any software, um, the, the developers can't really, I mean, they can make some good guesses as, as to what a, a good default deployment security stance should be, but, but there's no one answer. Um, it's really gonna come down to you having to be educated and informed about the software that you're using and have a good understanding of how its risks affect you. And I think to, um, well, from the keynote this morning, um, from one of the things that Edward Snowden said when, um, when he said was you have to eliminate a whole class of bugs, like you have to find a way to implement security so that, you know, okay, if, if maybe there's a black box type of your infrastructure or a part of the infrastructure that you don't understand or it's very complex, find a way to keep people out of it or find a way to isolate that from the rest of the environment so that even if, like let's say someone broke in and, and did something to Neutron, well, they should be confined within that area and not have a way to get out and spread somewhere else in the environment. So if you're not entirely sure what's secure and what's not, isolate it. Yeah, the, the Snowden connection is really quite interesting. Uh, for those that may not know and for the recorded audience, uh, at that same Portland summit, there was uh, a guy, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe, uh, from the NSA who spoke about how the NSA was deploying OpenStack. This was uh, six, eight months, I guess. N Nathaniel Burton. Nathaniel, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, first name right, last name wrong. 50-50, you know, it's not bad. Good odds. Uh, so the NSA is a OpenStack contributor and user. So, which is kind of interesting, whether or not Mr. Snowden was able to get documents out of a Cinder or Swift store, I cannot say, but it's kind of ironic, no pun intended on the word ironic, for him to advocate for silos when the lack of a silo in an improperly configured, perhaps, I don't know, OpenStack configuration allowed him to uh, reveal uh, interesting secrets. Uh, but. From that perspective, uh, and I didn't really want to get necessarily into threat attack vectors and that kind of thing, but uh, usually in my line of work, people talk about you know the malicious outsider. Uh, thanks to Mr. Snowden, people think about the insider, malicious whistleblower or otherwise. Uh, when people are thinking about security, whether it's a, a Barbican, VMT, uh, Ansible OpenStack, just OpenStack in general, how do you, uh, do you take the uh, zero trust least privilege model? Is that the right way to, to define things to prevent that malicious insider? So, yeah, I, I would say yes. Uh, that's one of the things that we were thinking about at Rackspace with our Barbican deployment is um, how can we configure this so that no one person can bring it down or destroy our data, right? Like, yeah, we trust everybody in our team, but who's to say, you know, Johnny whatever is going to get real upset about something tomorrow and, and try to take our whole system down. So I think it's definitely something that you should keep in mind and, and plan for. Yeah, from, from a vulnerability management process perspective, um, to take this from a different angle, uh, we, we also apply the principle of least privilege in, in our workflow. Um, so, you know, uh, general vulnerability report intake, we, we instruct people, educate people to provide those reports to us in private um, so that only the three people currently seated on the vulnerability management team um, know, uh, along with the reporter, presumably, um, the details of the vulnerability they've, dis they've discovered. We attempt to confirm whether they're reporting it against the correct project, and once we've done that, then we let a select subset of core reviewers for that particular project in on the report so that they can comment on it, vet whether or not this is a legitimate vulnerability. Um, you know, and, and there's this progressive disclosure model where we, we, we continue to, to try to limit the, um, the information flow for, for embargoed bug reports like that just to the people who are working on at least getting some sort of minimal fix uh, developed so they can, can stem the bleeding when we eventually go public with that particular vulnerability. Um, and then at that point, you know, it can, it can be further shored up and improved but at least once it's in the public eye, there's also a, a fix handy. Um, we, we also do a bit of uh, advanced disclosure to a select set of vetted downstream uh, consumers, some major public cloud providers, um, a lot of uh, distribution packagers, so that they can incorporate those fixes into their software in preparation for that announcement. Um, the typical uh, uh, coordinated disclosure model, really. 
Yeah, and, and you absolutely want to think about uh, defense in depth as you uh, set up your cloud. Uh, assume that one of those layers of defense is going to fail and the next one's going to minimize the impact that uh, that vulnerability exploit, um, um, the, the damage that can happen. And then you want to augment your defensive measures with uh, comprehensive audit logs and paying attention to them. So you, uh, if, if a breach does happen, you can identify it and plug it and stop it as soon as possible. And I think the zero trust is critical for other reasons. Like, obviously, you can have a malicious insider, but you can have an unintentional malicious insider. So, for example, you have five people on a team, and they're great people, and they love their job, but one of them, you know, took their computer somewhere and plugged a random USB stick into it, and now all of a sudden there's data being siphoned out, and they don't even know it. So you got, like, I affectionately call it an unintentional insider attack, that kind of thing. So you always have to find a way, and I think the audit logs help with that as well, uh, but find a way to just... Um, you know, have the least amount of access possible, and then when there is access, just audit it. Audit every single action. Yeah, in my line of work, at least half the breaches that I report on, uh, it's usually a, a privilege escalation uh, that was chained to something else, and that's just the way it is. So if you're not monitoring those privileged administrative accounts, uh, that's not good. Never, never, never run OpenStack as root, I would assume. <laughs> uh, but that's probably not a good idea in Linux in general. Sudo not aside, but we won't get into a sudo SU conversation. Um, we've got a good 18 minutes left. If anyone has any questions for the audience, feel free to. We've got two mics in the corner. Otherwise, we'll, we'll jump into the lightning round, and I've got a few interesting questions. Because when, uh, when I think of uh, certificate security, specifically Barbican and that kind of thing, a couple of years ago, it wasn't considered part of uh, DEF Core. And when I asked people, the vast majority weren't running certificates. What's happened in, in Barbican recently, and just for the Barbican guys specifically, uh, what's happened to Barbican recently to make it easier such that everyone is actually deploying it as they probably should? Yeah, um, one thing that's improved over the last few cycles is um, uh, services, um, other OpenStack services adopting it and, uh, and building in support with Barbican. So um, Octavia, our Neutron uh, load balancer as a service, can um, you know, pull the certificates that it needs when it creates a, a load balancer um, you know, at a Barbican. And that there's no user interaction required once it's configured. Octavia pulls it right from Barbican, and uh, Nova and Cinder and Glance can all uh, have, have extra security features. Um, so that uh, integration that takes place directly service to service, uh, I think, uh, helps with adoption. Just once it's configured, it uh, the, the, you get that uh, that support. Yeah, I think maybe one of the the problems we've had with barbican adoption is that people are maybe not thinking about the key management problem yet or are not ready to to solve it um i think adding barbican to uh as a core required service would would make great strides into getting bigger adoption of the service uh we're starting to make progress that way um as of this cycle the oslo team is going to adopt the castellan library uh, which you can think of as oslo.keymanager and so uh, moving forward, any OpenStack project that has key management requirements uh, is going to be able to use Castellan and, and be confident that something that works with Castellan is going to be available in their cloud. Uh, is Castellan a sub-project of Barbican? Is Castellan, yes, it's, a, it's, it, it's been owned by the Barbican team. Uh, and, and it really, you can think of it as uh, oslo.db, right? Like oslo.db doesn't tell you what database to use uh, other than it has to be SQL compliant. Uh, same thing with uh, Castellan. It's like an oslo.key manager and it lets you use a key manager with a certain feature set but doesn't mandate that it has to be Barbican. Fair enough. And then the only other question on the Barbican related stuff is sometimes when uh, I talk to people, there's confusion between Keystone and identity management and certificate management in Barbican is, am I the only one that hears that? I don't know if anyone else hears that or do you guys hear that? I, I hear it every day. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you do about that? Yeah, so, uh, so Keystone, Keystone is the identity manager and um, that's where you, you have your user ID, you have your roles, you have your domain. Um, that tells OpenStack who you are. What Barbican provides is uh, secret storage for that user. And um, the way it works is if I want to get access to my secrets, I'll tell Keystone, hey, my name's Dave and here's my password, and I get a token from Keystone. And that's Keystone's job to give tokens based on identity. Then I'll go to Barbican and say, please give me my secrets and here's my token. And Barbican can check that Keystone token and say, ah, I see you are Dave and I see that I have some secrets for Dave's and then it can return to me the secrets that I have access to. So, uh, so Barbican is for uh, secure storage of uh, very particular objects, 
and Keystone is for identity, and they, uh, they work together. And one, one way I like to think about that is um, maybe you have a safety deposit box. Keystone is sort of like the key to your safety deposit box, but it's not the contents of your safety deposit box. And I know you have a session tomorrow, so a little plug for Dave's session on uh, Barbican versus Vault, I, I believe. Yeah, in fact, later this afternoon, we have a hands-on workshop for Barbican. So if you want to uh, spend some time uh, hands-on with Barbican, that, uh, that's this afternoon. I, I recommend it. Uh, I'll watch it on video. Uh, and then from a vulnerability management perspective, uh, how does uh, the VMT actually work? So if I'll give you a wild card, let's say Tavis uh, Ormandy decides to tweet something Friday at 6 o'clock, do you guys uh, you care, but what happens? Um, well, first off, uh, I probably don't find out about it right away because I don't have a Twitter account. Um, <laughs> but uh, generally, I mean, so, you know, reporting things on Twitter is not really our, our recommended way of, of passing along vulnerability information. It's certainly a way, and it will eventually get to us through other people who are paying attention to, to Twitter specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, so someone points out something like that. Um, uh, pretty much our, our first order of business is to turn it into a, an, an actual bug report uh, in, in the, the defect tracker that we're using, um, which is currently Launchpad for the majority of projects, uh, launchpad.net. Um, and I mean, if it's, if it's already reported in the open like that, well, we can actually move on it a lot faster because the, the embargo process that we follow, and, and again, I'm, I'm for, for those of you who are familiar with the, the differences between coordinated disclosure and full disclosure, I, I tend to lean more toward the full disclosure community. I, I think that, that reporting these things in the open sooner actually solves things for a lot more people. But, um, but we do try to satisfy a lot of, uh, of different um, aspects of the community that would prefer uh, a, a slower, more uh, coordinated uh, disclosure approach. And so um, the embargo process when we get a, a private vulnerability report actually does slow us down quite a bit because we're having to carefully involve just the people who might be able to solve the problem and they may have to involve other people and the whole game of telephone takes time. Um, if it happens in the open, it's a bit more of a snowball approach. We, we just ingest every th bit of information we have about it into a bug report. We immediately start working in the open on trying to get to the bottom of whatever the, the cause of that vulnerability is if we can confirm that it's actually vulnerable and um, you know, the developer community generally engages far faster on, on those problems. Um, so, you know, uh, fixes get pushed right into public code review in that case, um, reviewed by the normal core reviewers, merged to the source code repositories. Um, generally in parallel with that, we're, we're already drafting an advisory with an you know, accurate impact description that's been confirmed by the developers and the reporter. Um, and we you know, send that out to, to every um, corner of, of the internet uh, as soon as we've got fixes pushed up for it. And those are almost immediately incorporated into point releases for the various stable branches picked up by downstream deployers, package uh, maintainers for distributions and so on. And, and just for coordinated disclosure, is there a standard 90 or 120 day policy or is it a case oh, by case? It, it's, um, it's actually, uh, I don't know, flexible is probably the wrong term, but uh, arbitrary. It mostly has to do with developer bandwidth. Um, and it, it's a lot easier, uh, this, this is, one of the places where I think that the embargoed and coordinated disclosure process falls down is that it's a lot easier for um, developers to uh, procrastinate on fixing vulnerabilities if they don't think they're widely known. So uh, it, because the vulnerability management team, while our responsibility is to coordinate, um, you know, the, the fixes and the reporting for these bugs, we're not, you know, generally directly involved in developing the fixes. We still need to engage um, developers who then find the time to, to provide uh, patches that you know those those core review teams are going to agree on. Um, so, tr trying to rally the, uh, the the troops within those uh, uh, security fix developer sub teams within the the different projects can can sometimes be a bit of a challenge and slow the process down. And, and so if you're running a private cloud, I think these vulnerability disclosures, like a full disclosure of vulnerability process, wouldn't be so painful because hopefully you've isolated um, the control plane, you know, all the APIs and horizon interfaces. Hopefully you've isolated that so a very small amount of people in your company would actually be able to reach it. 
So even if they said, hey, there's a vulnerability in Nova where you can show up and build a VM without a token, okay, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty gross. Like, that would be, that'd be pretty bad. Um, but on the same hand, if you only have five people that can access that API, you can go to them and say, look, this came out, here's the issue, no granting any access to anyone else until this is solved. Uh, but I would say on the public cloud side, as, as you know, working for a vendor that runs a public cloud, um, you know, a, a vulnerability like that that would allow someone to create let's say, a, a Nova VM without having a token would be a complete disaster. So a coordinated release would really help because that could potentially allow us to uh, get a patch put in place or disable part of the code or change the configuration value uh, before that goes out to the public and then you have, you know, kids at home trying to write their own scripts and take down the cloud. So, so the, the, the place where we strike a, a bit of a compromised balance between the two full disclosure, coordinated disclosure positions is that um, for embargoed private reports where we've developed the, the fix in secret, um, we, we do follow a fairly aggressive disclosure schedule once we have the fix. Um, and, and that is generally that we notify the, the list of, of vetted downstream stakeholders like uh, you know, Major's employer and, and others um, with five business days, um, advanced, well, three to five business days, it, it, it depends a little bit on the severity as well, um, advance notice, uh, and, and then we go ahead and we, we've provided them with a copy of the fix we're going to send, and as long as we don't discover within those few days that there are any changes that need to be made, then we go forward with the, the scheduled date that we've told them we're going to disclose it on. But that at least gives them a few days heads up to try to confirm that the fix isn't going to destroy their systems and hopefully have it ready to be rolled out when the announcement is made. But also bear in mind there's more vulnerabilities uh, within a cloud than just within OpenStack. So occasionally there may be a vulnerability in LibVirt, which is what Nova talks to to get VMs taken care of and that kind of thing. Or there could be a vulnerability in Galera that runs the database. There could be something like that. So um, you always have to make sure you're watching your OS vendors um, release list. So if you're using Red Hat or Debian or Ubuntu or wherever, make sure that you're following um, their feeds. So because there might be something that comes up with LibVirt that no one in the OpenStack community may be talking about at the time, um, and it may not come through proper OpenStack channels. So that's just something to keep in mind. We, we, we also, um, not so much from the VMT, but the, the security team in general um, bridges that gap a little bit with their security notes uh, process for, for some of the more esoteric um, related vulnerabilities like Major's talking about, um, where there may be a a vulnerability in some commonly used component that a lot of people are likely to have within their OpenStack deployment, but that's not OpenStack software, so the vulnerability management team isn't coordinating any sort of fix for it or anything. Um, we, we do sort of cherry pick, but the, the, the security notes editors, in situations where they think it's particularly beneficial, will draft a security note specifically about that related vulnerability so that hopefully, at least if people have missed the, the report from their distribution vendor or somewhere else, you know, they might see that security note and it gives them a bit of a heads up that, that this is something they should be keeping an eye out for. And if you're not running SE Linux in enforcing mode, please turn it on. <laughs> Thanks. And, and or app armor, right? <laughs> if you happen to be an app armor person. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes or a little bit less left if anyone has any questions. We've got mics uh, on both sides, uh, questions about how uh, the security project VMT, Barbican, uh, security in general works. Um, and uh, we can do that, no questions, which means everybody is running securely, which is great. Oh, we've got a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, I had a, had a quick question about uh, uh, some of the operating system agents uh, that are available. I actually only know just a few, like Marshall for grabbing the key and then using it to enable like file system encryption. Uh, is there any other tools or plans for you know, updating those to be able to do file level encryptions or application level instead of just the whole operating system level? As far as, as, far as OpenStack is concerned, so some OpenStack projects are already looking to integrate with Barbican to provide application level encryption. Uh, and so Swift is one of those projects that uh, is working on, on having an encrypted Swift storage uh, in which they use those encryption, key, or they use Barbican to store the encryption keys that are being used for that encryption. Um, I believe Cinder uh, has also integrated to where you can get, uh, it's kind of OS level encryption because they encrypt the, the entire block thing, but the encryption keys that are being used to do that are being stored in Barbican. So, uh, 
it's one of the reasons we, we would like to see higher adoption of Barbican. I think it, it helps with a lot of these workflows and, and to being able to provide um, encryption at, at different uh, layers of the stack. Um, also, be sure to fact check me on this because I'm not 100% certain, but I think I want to say Freezer has some encrypted backup uh, capabilities as well, um, at least worth looking at. Um, and they probably should if they don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so a lot of the projects store passwords in clear username and password in config files. Uh, is there any, any way to secure that? With one, that's one of the things that keeps getting dinged for us. So the question was: uh, Some of the projects are, are are saving passwords in clear text. Is there a way to make sure that that doesn't happen? So. Um, there's something I would like to see. Uh, there, there's a conversation that needs to happen. Uh, so I think a lot of OpenStack projects realize this is a problem. Um, I think uh, probably also config would be a good place to fix this, right? Uh, one of the things that we've talked about on the Barbican team is, you know, could we work something out with the Oslo folks to have uh, Barbican support in Oslo config so that you wouldn't have to change every single project, the projects are all already using also config and, and just instead of reading uh, those configs from a file to be able to reach out to Barbican and grab those. Um, one of the challenges there is that because Barbican depends on Keystone, you'll still need uh, to get your Keystone credentials from somewhere, right? Uh, and sort of the best practice for that is to use some sort of uh, configuration management to provide those so that you don't have to write them to disk. Yeah, um, there, there was a, I want to say it was earlier today, and I missed it, um, there was a forum session on uh, clear text passwords in, uh, well, there's, there's a hand waving in the background, it, you, you were there? Can, 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 can you come up to the, to the mic and, and, and fill us in a little bit? I, I, I'm curious if, if there were any resolutions out of that. So we actually just did a proof of concept, nothing. I think we're going to start pushing up specifically starting with Oslo config. Uh, basically, we used uh, Custodia to uh, interact between Barbican and Keystone. So it would pull the secrets from Barbican and then just authenticate with Keystone. And then you could actually encrypt, or not encrypt, uh, you would use the Barbican container reference or key name instead of the actual password itself in the configuration file. Awesome. Um, so that, that's certainly one route. Um, there have been very recent discussions uh, as of this week also about um, uh, mostly using for lock management, but integrating etcd into the you know set of expected services that we can use. And that it's been discussed also that it would be possible for us to store specific configuration elements within etcd. We could use it for things like passwords so they're not kept on disk on the on the systems. Those systems still need access to those passwords in some way, though. So it's not really buying you a whole lot of additional security if they need a clear text password. Um, the, the alternatives that we've discussed architecturally over the years are finding ways to get rid of password-based authentication for these services anyway. I mean, the, ultimately, the solution should look more like, you know, and, and not specifically this. Um, people would probably shoot me for suggesting it, though I'm a big fan, but, uh, you know, rolling out Kerberos uh, so that the services authenticate via some ticket granting system uh, rather than relying on some fixed secret. Yeah, and in the meantime, until there is a solution, you know, make sure your config files that have sensitive information are locked down with SE Linux. So only the Nova process can read the Nova config file, and uh, that'll help mitigate uh, the concern about uh, the clear text passwords. Policy. Policy is always the way. Uh, SE Linux, App Armor, etc. Uh, I think we're out of time, right? So we're right at 4:20. So if everyone will thank me, thank me, thank the panelists uh, for being here, and thank you all for uh, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.